computer scientist Fei Fei Li once said, artificial intelligence is not a substitute for human intelligence. It is a tool to amplify human creativity and ingenuity. So how do we get AI into the hands of more engineers? How do we amplify that human creativity in our own EE backyard? I would contend that open source measures and lowering the barriers to entry can make a huge difference getting artificial intelligence into real world designs. Folks, I am talking about democratizing AI. Are you on board? I certainly hope so, because that's exactly what we're talking about today. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Peter T. from Intel and I explore how Intel is making AI implementation easier than ever before. We examine the typical workflows involved in artificial intelligence designs, the benefits that Intel's scalable Xeon processor brings to AI projects, and how you can take advantage of the Intel AI ecosystem to further innovation in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Intel. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me. Amelia, so good to be here. Thank you. So we're talking all about Intel's advancements in the world of AI today. But Peter, where does Intel stand now in terms of artificial intelligence? You know, Amelia, this is such an exciting market and such a great opportunity for everybody listening in today. And I've got sort of a multi-step answer for you. You know, first, I want to point out AI is not new to Intel. We've been building unique AI features into our CPUs for a couple of years now. And I like to call this AI on IA or artificial intelligence on Intel architecture. The second point is, most importantly, we have an unsurpassed ecosystem. We can build features into the hardware, but if the platforms, the tools, and the applications that make up the AI world don't see those features, they just sit there and they don't do anything. So we've got a great ecosystem based on, for the most part, open source, which we believe really helps also lower the cost of entry for AI for many of our customers. And third, we really talk about the value to the customer. And in this case, it's about lowering that entry point. We want to allow more AI to run natively on the CPU. There's a time and a place for a GPU, but more of this work can run natively on the CPU. We lower that entry cost, and therefore we open up the total available market for the partners listening in today. And, you know, we call this the democratizing of AI. And that means making it available to everybody. Every time that cost comes down, more customers can afford to get into the AI space and take advantage of this technology. Fantastic. Now, Peter, with all of the recent innovations in the world of AI, how we think about artificial intelligence needs to change, right? Yeah, you're correct. There's kind of a perception out there today that AI equals NVIDIA equals GPUs. And look, there's a time and a place for a GPU. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But it's kind of interesting because if we look at the data from industry standard research analysts, we see that today, 70 plus percent of inferencing is running on an Intel Xeon processor. That's Intel. That's not even our competitors' products. And that means a lot of compute is already happening on technology that our partners already have deployed and trust and are used to using. So we think that's really important. What's even more interesting is as we build new features into our products, as an example, our latest fourth gen Xeon scalable processor family, we have a new accelerator in there that's dedicated for AI, we kind of call it AI on steroids, something called AMX, Advanced Matrix Extensions. And when we take advantage of those, 
we dramatically increase the performance that we're delivering for many, many AI workloads. So that inferencing number is going to go up, but also we're starting to do more machine learning natively on the CPU. Now, that's not going to eliminate the need for GPUs. We are getting into the GPU business here at Intel, but more often than not, this can be done without, and that lowers that entry point, if you will. And that's important because when you add a GPU, especially our competitor's GPU, you're now into a proprietary coding environment that's expensive. The cards themselves are expensive. The thermals that they put off add to you know heat and how you design your data centers and your server pools and also demand more electricity. So again, where we can eliminate those, we can lower that cost, opening up that market. But again, there's definitely a time and a place for a GPU. So can you walk me through the steps of AI integration? What does the workflow look like? Yeah, that's a great question as well. I think this one's really important because we need to think of AI not just residing at one place. It's not just one server or a, a cluster of servers that it's running on. There's different places that compute happens throughout the process of an AI platform. And here on this slide on the far left, we have what we call data, the data preparation, right? And that's typically happening on a high-end workstation. It could have our Xeon server technology inside of the workstation, or it could be a high-end desktop with our Intel Core family. And the majority of data scientists are doing this data prep today on an Intel CPU. So that's kind of one part, and that's a big part. I really don't want that data preparation side to be overlooked for how important it is. Now, when we go to the middle of the slide, we talk about the modeling. Now, so think of this as the machine learning, in some cases, deep learning as a subset of machine learning. Here, you've got bigger servers, more powerful architecture, and in some cases, a GPU either a competitor's or one of the GPUs that we've come out with as we're starting to build out our GPU line as well. But that's a subset of AI. And the big busy part of this, if you will, is the deploying. Okay, so now, you know, I've prepped the data, I've trained the system, now I want this to be utilized across a part of the business and having the data roll through it and be analyzed by the application. That's what we call deploy or think of inferencing, right? This is where we're running the application. And again, in majority of cases, that can be done natively on the CPU itself. And that may be split up. It may not all be on a server. Some of it may actually run on a desktop or a mobile CPU or a lower end server platform or something at the edge. And the edge is a very important part of this because edge compute is growing, right? People want to analyze and take advantage of AI where the data exists from. And that is now becoming the edge. The edge is one of the best growth opportunities within the server market today. And it's super exciting. So all this distributed compute is out there helping doing all this inferencing to bring value to that AI application. And I want to also reinforce that what this means is we're not just building unique AI features into our server platform. We're also building them into desktops and mobile. It's already been in there for a couple of years. We're going to continue to enhance those. Even our Ethernet NIC cards that Intel makes now have a AI story built into them. And really, in that case, it's part of lowering the cost of giving the server cluster great balanced performance without having to spend the money on InfiniBand, as an example. It can be done on traditional Ethernet. So we're excited that every product we make now needs to answer the question of how am I helping the customer have a better AI experience? Okay, so what kind of software support does Intel offer for each of those steps? Yeah, so this is probably one of the most important aspects of this whole conversation. So our engineers at Intel, we can build a feature into a mobile processor, a NIC card or a server processor 
But if the software community is not seeing that feature, it just sits there and doesn't do anything. And I think what surprises a lot of people is that at Intel, you know, we're kind of viewed as a hardware company. We actually have around 15,000 software engineers. And we are spending a lot of time in the open source community, contributing to the Linux community, and of course, working with what I call the corporate ISVs, the Microsofts, the VMwares of the world. And what we do is, specifically in the AI space, is we work with the platform, the tools, the frameworks, and the libraries to make sure that there's an Intel distribution of that that's tuned, scaled, and optimized to take advantage of these AI hardware features or new instructions that we're putting into our CPUs. So that's a tremendous software engineering effort that goes on. And I'll give you an example. We launched our fourth generation Xeon processor family earlier this year. There's a variety of innovative technology in that processor family that differentiates us from our competitor. One of those innovations is an AMX instruction set. You see it at the bottom right on this slide. That already has a great support from so many of the AI platforms, tools, and libraries that are out there because of all this software enabling work that we have done in this space. So we're very proud of that. And what that brings forward to our customers is Instead of having a 40, 50% increase in performance because they went to a new generation of processor, in this case, when you take advantage of this unique accelerator, we're seeing 300, 500, 700% increases in performance because it's been tuned in with the software and the frameworks and the libraries to take advantage of it. So I would argue that this ecosystem support is really the backbone and the critical part of the value that Intel brings to the AI market space. Otherwise, like I said, it ends up just being a hardware feature and it doesn't get used. That makes sense. Now, Peter, can you give me some details about that Xeon scalable processor? Yeah, a bit of an eye chart here, but I'll just kind of talk through it. So again, this processor family that we launched earlier this year, this fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable processor family, this is not the first one to have AI features built in. This is really the third Xeon family that's had it. The previous one, we had something called DL Boost that gave a really nice performance, especially on the inferencing side. Now we've really taken that, and this is what I call AI on steroids. And this new AMX instruction set that I referenced earlier that all those platforms can see and take advantage of is driving dramatic increases in performance. And when I talk about 300, 500, 700% increase in performance, I'm talking about standard AI benchmarks that are accepted by the industry. This isn't just custom stuff that we're doing in a lab. So we're very proud of of how many of these benchmarks are showing great performance. And this is, like I said, this is just one example of the innovation that we've done in this processor family. There's other innovations in there as well, other accelerators. And these are things our competitors are not doing. We really have to look at CPUs differently than we have in the past. It's not just the number of cores, it's how efficient those cores are. And these accelerators, such as AMX, make the individual cores higher performing. And when we can bring a higher level performance, again, it comes down to lowering that entry point, need less servers or less cores, less software licenses to run that AI application. That's the real benefit at the end of the day. Okay, so what kind of benefits are you seeing when it comes to data, modules, and deploying AI with Xeon? Yeah, so I'm going to go back to that idea of the compute for AI is happening in different places, right? We talked about the data, the data processing. We talked about the modeling, the machine learning, if you will, and then the deployment, that's the inferencing. And the value we're bringing forward here is we kind of covered the data Prep one is a majority of that work is happening on an Intel CPU already. So it's proven to be trusted by the data scientists and the architects that are prepping the data and preparing these systems. The middle one, 
not only can a lot of this workload happen on the CPU, but in some cases, not all, we're eliminating the need for that expensive GPU. And that's by bringing a higher level of ML performance, machine learning performance. In this case, we're comparing it to an NVIDIA A100 card. And again, across about 20 workloads, we're seeing this 30% increase in performance. And again, we've lowered the cost by not needing that proprietary coding cost of the card, the thermals, and the electricity draw that it creates. And then finally, on the far right, again, this is not new. We've been doing this for a while, but that 70% number is going to increase. The inferencing, 70% of it today, the industry tells us, is running on an Intel Xeon processor. And that number will continue to go up as we innovate and continue to add new features that the software ecosystem can see and take advantage of. So we are just really, really proud of all this innovation. And again, I want to remind the audience, this is not just in the server space, client space, desktops, mobile, workstation, Ethernet, everything across the board. We want to design to deliver a better AI experience. Fantastic. Now, What main points would you like my audience to take away from today's Chalk Talk? Yeah, thanks for asking, Amelia. So, you know, first, AI is not new to Intel. We've been building features in for many years, and we will continue to do that. And each time, that's innovation, and that really separates us from what our competition is doing. My second point, it's about an open source ecosystem. Open source allows there to be multiple tools. It allows for rapid tuning, scaling, and optimizing, and it lowers the cost. So we do a better job making the hardware perform better. Open source lowers the overall cost of the platforms, and that opens up the total available market to more customers. And that's really the third part, this democratizing AI, making it available to everybody So it moves from enterprise that have huge budgets and tens and tens, uh, if not hundreds of data scientists. It moves into the mid-tier space and now moving into the SMB market. So I would say these three points our audience can use as conversations. Use these as the conversation starters. You know, did you know Intel has been doing this for a while? Do you understand the importance of the ecosystem? Do you see the value of a lower cost AI platform? So now maybe you can do that project that you've been wanting to do. So these are great conversation starters to find those AI opportunities. And, you know, finally, I really like to end with this. A lot of people, you talk about AI, they think autonomous cars and robots, things like that. Those are all cool, fun to look at, really neat stuff going on. But I think another key takeaway here is there's a lot of mundane processes that can be automated with AI. And I'll give you an example. At Intel, we have something called the Intel Inside Program. We pay co-op dollars for when a computer manufacturer runs an ad, TV, print, radio, whatever it may be, and they have Intel connected to that ad. We pay them a few dollars to have our logo on those ads as well as obviously doing engineering work with them behind the scenes. So we get literally thousands of requests every week for, you know, hey, Intel, you owe me money. I ran an ad. I'm requesting this amount of money. Our IT group stood up a few servers, not some big special AI department. Our IT group stood up a few servers with image recognition, trained it over a few months to look at all these requests. And what we resulted in was, Faster response time, we were able to get them their money quicker. We were able to find fraudulent requests. We were able to find duplicates. It happens on occasion. And in some cases, we actually said, hey, you didn't ask for enough money. We know that ad ran more based on our analytics. We actually owe you more money than you've asked for. Bottom line was a $20 million savings to a rather mundane bureaucratic process. So the challenge I would have for everybody listening is think about your partners, think about your customers, and some of them probably have some process that just image recognition alone could help improve. And that's a great way to start. When you can prove it out on something like that, they're going to see value and they're going to come back and they're going to want to do more projects. And then the last thing I'm going to say is you can't talk about AI in this day and age without talking about 
Gen AI and the impact that that's happening on the market. There's a lot of press. Everybody's still trying to figure it out. Today, Gen I, as an example, think chat GPT is open and public. And that means companies don't want to run their own information on that. And by the way, there's not a lot of security when it's public. And by the way, you don't know for sure you're getting a correct, accurate answer, right? There's no proofing. So we see a very interesting inflection point happening here where many, many customers are going to want to develop their own version, taking advantage of Gen AI, but bring it in-house. That's going to drive on-prem server business. That's going to drive services opportunities to help them build these systems out. Now, to build out a chat GPT is millions and millions of dollars. So these will probably be smaller in-house solutions that are focused on a specific part of the business. And then when that proves out, they can build another one. So, you know, smaller number of parameters, but still adding value. And the company can have the security and protect their intellectual capital by bringing it in-house. So we think Gen AI is the next inflection point of AI. And all of our customers are trying to figure out how to take advantage of it. So great mundane processes that can be automated with AI. And then we got this Gen AI explosion. I think those are two things to look for. Excellent. Well, Peter, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for your time and for everybody listening today. I appreciate it. Have a great day. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Intel. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.